I'd like to welcome all our participants to today's webinar, the first of two, as just mentioned, two webinars today for the second national stand down to prevent struck by incidents. My name is Doug Trout. I'm a medical officer with CDC and NIOSH and a member of the NIOSH NORA Construction Sector Council. I'll be assisting and moderating this webinar today, and I'm standing in for Mike Mills, who you may have seen on the announcement. We want to thank and recognize Mike for the work and time he put into preparing this webinar, arranging for this panel discussion, and being one of the leaders of this national stand down. The NIOSH Office of Construction, Safety, and Health is happy to support and promote this national struck by stand down, along with OSHA's Alliance program, including partners in the Work Zone Safety Alliance and with CPWR, the Center for Construction Research and Training. And specifically, I'd like to thank Jess Bunting and Tyler Simpson for their great help with making this happen. Struck by incidents are the leading cause of non-fatal injuries among construction workers and the second leading cause of death among construction workers. The four most common struck by hazards are being struck by a flying, falling, swinging, or rolling object. For this current webinar, this year's stand down has expanded the focus to specifically include lift zones. In this webinar, you'll hear from our panel of experts about the responsibilities of a lift director and the basics to look, for, look out for in a lift zone, the most prevalent issues and incidents experienced, and best practices for lift safety. We have three great presenters today who have a wealth of experience and expertise to share. Our first presenter will be Tom Gordon, and maybe we could switch to good. Tom is a 32-year member of the International Union of Operating Engineers and has been a training director for IUOE Local 14, 14B for seven years. Tom is currently on a number of local and national committees involving safety standards, testing, and best practice protocols in the construction industry. He specializes in crane and rigging safety. Next slide, please. All right, Tom will be followed by Dr. Jim Weithorn. Dr. Weathorn is an engineering specialist with International Crane and Construction Safety Solutions, LLC, and has been involved in crane use and operations for his entire career. Dr. Weathorn is a main committee member of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers B30 standard, as well as a subcommittee member of the B30.3 tower cranes and B30.29 self-erect tower cranes committees. Dr. Weathorn also serves on the National Commission for the Certification of Crane Operator Tower Crane Committee and Rigging Task Force Committee. And, and to, uh, the third of our three presenters today will be Mike Parnell. Mike is a senior consultant with Industrial Training International and has been directly involved in the past with the leadership of the ASME B30 and P30 lifting standards. As you may know, as we mentioned earlier, there are two events today in the second webinar today at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Another great panel will discuss their specific experiences and addressing struck by incidents and identifying improvements and strategies to better avoid. We hope at the end of the, the, uh, the formal presentations to be able to address as many of the questions as that we got ahead of time and that may show up in the chat. Uh, and we'll have to, uh, we'll uh, do our best to address as many of your questions as we can. So I'd like to thank our current panelists for sharing their time and expertise with us today. And now I'll turn the program over to uh, Tom Gordon. Hi, Doug. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, Doug, I just wanted to thank you, uh, Jessica Tyler, and, and Mike, unfortunately, he's not here today. And uh, the people at NIOSH, CPWR, the OSHA Alliance, for organizing this national stand down and asking me to be part of a panel that contains two of uh, the most well respected people in the crane and rigging industry, and uh, Jim Whitethorn and Mike Parnell. Um, next slide, please. Oh, this, well, we can go through this, the objectives. Uh, today's objectives are going to be to discuss the key roles and responsibilities of the people involved in, in the lifts identifying the risks that need to be reviewed before a lift is made, discussing the risk factors that lead to the um, struck by incidents that we're speaking about, and discussing the best practices that hopefully people will uh, you know, take advice on and implement in the future. Next slide, please. 
the roles and responsibilities for these particular uh, people that we're speaking about, the, the general contractor is, he's usually responsible for the contractual requirements, including deliverables, ensuring the performance of the work on the site. And he's supposed to make sure that the safety requirements are there, uh, and not just there, but that they're established and implemented. Uh, the lift director, we're going to get into a lot deeper in the next few slides. Um, he's going to be verifying categories of load, reviewing and implementing the lift plan, uh, but we'll speak more about him uh, later on. The crane operator, load handling equipment operator, that's the person who is responsible for directly controlling the crane's functions. The rigger is responsible for performing whatever rigger tasks happen to be associated with that load handling activity that you're doing that day. And the signal man, the uh, eyes and ears of that crane operator. He's responsible for directing movements of the crane by supplying and providing signals to the operator so that uh, everybody's you know, aware of what's going on with the crane and where it's gonna be moving. Next slide, please. The lift director's jobs. Um, the lift director's responsibilities are very wide ranging. Um, we're gonna to touch on some of them. They're not all of the responsibilities of a lift director. He could be tasked with many different responsibilities depending on site specific requirements, local regulations, and the general contract that he happens to be working for. He could have more added to his plate or he could have some taken away. He could possibly be wearing two hats. The lift director could also be a site supervisor, uh, a safety coordinator, or, or a foreman. Um, just looking at the uh, the blurbs on the screen here, if you start in the top left, stopping crane operations if alerted to an unsafe condition. There, there is no excuse for not checking into anything that is considered an unsafe condition before um, a lift is being made. Ensure the preparation of the area, the ground conditions uh, to support the, complete, the, the crane before the lift is made. If the foundation isn't there for the crane, if the if the ground isn't compacted properly, if the, the right plates or matting isn't there, it doesn't matter how big a crane you have or how good your rigging or plan is. If the foundation is no good, then uh, you know your lift is doomed right from the start. Uh, directly underneath the sphere of safety is uh, barricading of the swing radius and the work zone. Incredibly necessary to prevent injuries from to workers who aren't involved in that lift, people who are on other parts of the job that happen to wander into somewhere and not know what they're looking at. The uh, top right hand corner, ensuring the necessary traffic controls are in place for workers in the general public. If you happen to be working on a city street or on a site that's adjacent to a city street, you have to really be sure that your traffic controls are in place because it's bad enough when workers from other parts of a job walk in where they're not supposed to be, but civilians have no PPE on and really no idea of what's going on. Uh, addressing any safety concerns of the operator or the other personnel involved in the operation. Again, this goes back with addressing any unsafe conditions that are brought to him. Everybody needs to be aware and, and feel safe that this is being uh, conducted in the, in the right way. Next slide, please. On the left-hand side, there's a picture of a crane um, rolling around underneath a power line, uh, holding a load in the air. Anytime you're working around power lines or dealing in situations with power lines, whether you're assembling or disassembling a crane near power lines, traveling underneath it, or working around power lines for the job site, you should be following the guidelines set up in 1926-1400, um, the OSHA standards. Uh, there's very specific standards set in their guidelines for what you should be working for. And you, you really need to be aware of those. And the lift director should be making sure that the plan is based around them if there's power lines around. Ensuring that the precautions are taken during out of the ordinary lifts. Now, if you get into critical picks, and, and we're going to get into the difference between critical picks and standard picks in a, in a couple of slides. Once you enter that area of critical picks, that lift director's job jumps into another, another category. Um, there's many more things he's got to be aware of, many more things that he's got to check and take into consideration. Appointing a signal person and making sure that they meet the requirements of 1926-1400 uh, OSHA crane standards. It's probably one of the most understated 
requirements of the lift director. And, and one of the jobs that people don't really always think is such a big thing, but from somebody who ran a crane for many years, there was nobody who was more important to you during the course of the day than your signal person. He could make it a, a, an easy, uh, enjoyable day or a really miserable day. So appointing that signal person is a very key job for the lift director. Next slide, please. Being on site during all lifting operations, it's really necessary for the lift director to be on site and he really should be there maybe a day before or earlier, um, checking the site out, seeing what the conditions are. You really want to be engaged in the site when you're the lift director because there's always changing dynamics, companies moving machines around, access roads being changed, um, you know, different structures being erected. And if you haven't been on site during the lifting operation, it's going to be very difficult to keep track of that. Ensuring that the load is properly rigged and balanced by qualified personnel as per OSHA 1926, 1400. Another incredibly important job, and he really needs to make sure that his, his riggers and his signal people are trained and qualified. On the right-hand side, uh, that last blurb is informing the operator of the weights of the loads and what the plan is for moving and placing them. Uh, the lift director has to have really good communication with the operator. It's, it's paramount that he, he really has a relationship to where they can talk to each other and bang ideas off each other if, if something comes up. You don't want a relationship to where one doesn't feel comfortable with the other and something comes up to one of them and they don't really want to address it with the other. So it, that relationship and communication really needs to stay open. That's a big part of the lift director's job. Uh, the next slide, please. Now, speaking again about the the lift direct, the um, signal person and the riggers. Looking at this slide with your so showing center of gravity, it's, it's just like a quick thing to show you how quick things can go bad. That slide on the left, which is showing the hook point or the, or the tip of the boom directly over the center of gravity is gonna assure a lift that's gonna come up straight. Now, you're gonna have possibly different size slings. If you have a, a, an asymmetrical load that you're picking, like in this picture, you can see one side the sling is longer than the other. Now, you're probably going to end up encountering chain falls, come alongs, things like that, in order to come to that uh, balance point so that, you know, you know, your rigging is proper for lifting it under the center of gravity. If you were to pick it like the middle slide, where your hook point or the tip of the boom is kicked to one side, what's gonna happen is what you see in that next picture. The load is always gonna find its balance point. Right? That's, anytime you pick a load, that center of gravity is gonna always kick to below the tip of the boom or the hook point is what, how it's portrayed in this slide. And you can imagine if that, if that was a concrete block and it weighed five or six tons, and because it wasn't picked over the center of gravity and it kicked like that, yeah, you could have however much damage to what you're picking or what's around it, but you could have people really harmed when a load kicks off like that. So making sure that the load is um, hooked up properly is really important and uh, another major part of the lift director. Next slide, please. Load handling considerations. This is what's going to determine whether or not you have a standard lift plan or a critical lift plan. Um, this is kind of what we were talking about a couple of slides before, uh, where if you have a critical lift, you're going to end up with more responsibilities. Reading through this, your potential of hazards to other people, kind of like the lift we were just talking about before, where if it kicks off and hits someone, you know, uh, are there pinch points? Or is the pig very tight where people are walking around in, in between walls? Are hazards in the proximity to the work area? Do you have power lines? Do you have underground utilities? Uh, are there other cranes in the area or other equipment? The complexity of the load handling activity. Is it something that you have to use come alongs, chain falls? Do you have to slide something uh, along or into a building? 
the adverse effect there, impact from the environmental conditions. Is it raining? Is it snowing? Um, is there ice accumulating on the boom? Do you, do you have uh, a call for heavy winds later? These are all different environmental conditions you need to check. Has it been raining and the ground softened up from when you set the crane up? All these different things have to be checked into. Load handling equipment capacity and performance, and then the rigging capacity and or performance. Do you have the proper crane? Is the crane big enough for what you want to do? Are you on the border? Um, same thing goes for your rigging. Is it in proper order? Is it, is it, uh, has it been checked by somebody and is it strong enough to do what you want to do? Adverse commercial impact. Do you, are you going to shut down a part of an oil refinery? Are you going to close down streets that are going to affect businesses? The adverse commercial impact of your pick is something that needs to be taken into account. Site requirements unique to the load handling activity. Are there certain uh, rules that you can only pick 50% of the capacity of the load of the crane? Are you only allowed to be a certain amount of feet from a power line that maybe their restrictions are bigger than OSHA's? Site requirements that are unique to that activity could um, range from all different kinds of things. And, and you could also be in a place that's not used to doing construction activity. Maybe this is in a place that's used to having a crane in the middle of their job. So they may have, you know, different uh, requirements that you are not aware of on normal jobs. Is it going to be repetitive lifts? Are you going to be going in and out or is it strictly just going to be one pick? These will determine whether or not your standard lift plan or, or a critical lift plan. Next, next slide, please. Basically, this is your standard lift plan. Um, your load handling activities can be accomplished through standard procedures. There's nothing out of the ordinary. It's kind of common methods, things that your, your workers are used to doing on a daily basis. Um, it does not require a written plan. A standard lift plan does not require a written, written plan. Now, a critical lift plan, that means that you're exceed, exceeding the standard lift plan criteria and you need additional planning. You need to have other procedures taken into place you need to uh, mitigate your, your greater risks. There could be many different things that you're going to have to get into. Is it a two crane pick? Are uh, you lifting personnel? Uh, are you lifting something up that can't be broken? If it breaks, it can't be replaced. So these are different scenarios that are going to have you have to have a written plan and have you go into uh, a, a totally different uh, way of going about this job. Next slide, please. Okay, the pre-lift meeting. Probably one of the most important things that's done on the job. During that pre-lift meeting, you're gonna to wanna to review the activities. Um, when we have a teaching crane operators, basically we always make sure to tell them, make sure you know what does it weigh? What are you lifting? Is it symmetrical or asymmetrical? And where does it have to go? The handling sequence, covers that. Where is this pick going? What, what do you have to do once you have it in the air? The personnel assignments. What is everyone's job? Does everybody know what their responsibilities are? There may be site-specific safety issues, hazards that you have to go over, and also what's the emergency plan if that lift has to, has to be abandoned? What are the communication methods being used? The questions and solutions for that have to be brought up and solved in the pre-lift meeting. If they can't be solved there, they have to be taken back and you would review your plan. And you would also review with everyone before they go to work if they understand everything in the meeting. If you look at that picture on the left, looks like a pretty basic, big, basic pick that they're going over, picking a pipe, couple of slings, you know, may end up just falling under a standard lift plan. That pick on the right is uh, disconnecting a tower crane boom from a tower crane. Um, there's come alongs, there's chain falls involved. Um, you know, the pick points had to be engineered. So these are different situations that it would call for whether you had a standard pick and no written plan, or in this situation, you definitely would have had a written plan. Uh, that's all I have, and I will pass it on to Jim Whitethorn. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, what did happen. Um, we, in a lot of our planning and so forth, we prepare for uh, hazards and for accidents that could potentially happen. And this data is looking at a 35-year program. Um, looked, uh, I've examined over 1,200 crane accidents and have put together a, a significant database that I might add, we are now joined forces with the Construction Industry Institute, and we're going to be uh, bringing in other uh, major companies to contribute their accidents also, uh, to make this even, uh, besides being the largest in the world, uh, to be even greater. Uh, one of the things that we have to do in any type of analysis is uh, establish the data. And so with the help of the director, Directorate of uh, Construction, um, they pulled together all of the fatalities from crane accidents from 1992 to 2016. And first of all, we wanted to see how do we correlate, how's my study running versus uh, what they have found um, or what they've been documenting. And then also look at the correlation between the total number of accidents and those that involve fatalities. If you look at the red line uh, that runs through the center, those are the uh, fatalities according to OSHA. Uh, the blue line, the next one, is the total number of accidents that I had looked at each year uh, going through 2017. And then the orange down at the bottom are the fatalities. So uh, when, you, when you get down toward about midway, we start to plot out pretty close uh, to the fatalities uh, in, on a smaller scale. Um, as to what OSHA is. And this is critical because we want to make sure, uh, although uh, as a forensic engineer, I'm not going to be looking at every single accident, but we do need to have a good cross-section to select from. And I, I might add, all of these studies, all of these analysis were done by uh, forensic engineers that uh, are heavily involved in cranes and rigging accidents and so and all serve on national committees so the, it's very appropriate for them to be doing it as compared to someone that's sent out by some other organizations that don't have that training uh, in that particular area next slide please when we look at uh, the year from 92 through 2016 osha had a total number of fatalities of 868 uh, we had 100, 159. Now, to be able to get a, a correlation, uh, if we divide that in, we get about 34, about 35 fatalities per year uh, in crane accidents. Our ratio uh, of total accidents to those that involve a fatality is about 4.8. And so when we multiply those two together, we come up uh, with approximately 167 accidents a year. Uh, over 35 years, that's 5,833. So it's quite a, quite a number. Uh, initially, that 167 looked small, um, but uh, it, in the grand scheme of things, it is uh, very appropriate from what we, uh, we have been found, finding and also that of OSHA. Uh, just uh, from an analytical standpoint, we always do a, a confidence level. And so if you look at the, the, uh, the box below it, estimated confidence level, uh, we're looking at about a 99% uh, with a 4.5% error. So the 701 accidents out of the total available of 5,800 is a good number uh, that will give you some valid results. Next slide, please. And if we look at the, I separated the accidents into types uh, rather than causes uh, because it's easier to identify because what may look like uh, one thing out on the site, once you get into the nuts and bolts of it, uh, the cause is something uh, actually considerably different. Uh, so these are the lists of percentages. Uh, number one type of accident is a crane overturn. Uh, and that's probably led most by having the wrong load um, or wrong input data into your LMI uh, that's causing uh, the cranes to overturn when they, you have a number of devices there to prevent that from happening. 
then down toward the bottom, unstable dropped and lost loads. That's number two. Uh, and here we're talking, like Tom was saying, about the stability of the load, making sure it's it's balanced, because when you first come up with it, um, you're going, going to have a rendering. Uh, the center of gravity will go underneath the boom tip. Um, and depending on the load and its configuration can be fairly rapid. Um, that's another reason why we want always to keep workers away from uh, the load when you're initially bringing it up. Uh, I know one of the uh, items that we find more and more is the crane operator booming up first to try to take out that boom deflection so that uh, when it finally load does come up, that it won't be drifting on you, even if it is a balanced load. Uh, in descriptions on the right hand side, you've seen uh, several of them thus far, but for, from a study standpoint, we needed to separate the iron, iron workers out. We needed, we, so we set the rigger as the person that physically connects the, the, the load to the rigging, whereas an iron worker would be up receiving the load and disconnecting because there is considerable difference uh, between the two. Obviously, the operator, signal person, oiler, management is anyone that's uh, a supervisory, but not physically involved in the lift. And then other field personnel. Uh, these are all of the other workers, all of the other management, anyone that is not directly involved with the lifting procedure itself, they would fall into that category. And then, uh, unfortunately, we also have pedestrians and bystanders, people that are watching, get a little bit too close, and we can have the uh, situation, uh, injuries and fatalities from that as well. Next slide. And I probably one of the most surprising things that I we found with the study, if you look at other first personnel, there are more fatalities of other field personnel than any other trade on the site. And that that was shocking to, to, my, uh, to my view. Uh, people that are uh, shouldn't be in the area. Um, I mean, we've had uh, trades come in and, and set up their plan shack directly under the middle of erecting steel. Uh, so you've got to keep people out of the area uh, in, in where you're working and where you're conducting those, uh, those lifts. Uh, number two was the operator relative to fatality, and number three was the iron worker. Uh, so the river isn't even in the top three when it comes to fatalities. Uh, and if you look, uh, I've divided the, uh, so I can break the data down into 10 different categories. Uh, we can have an overall number, and then we can look at um, arborist, logging and agriculture, commercial construction, highway, road and bridge, industrial and refining, manufacturing, marine, mining, oil field land base, and oil field uh, offshore, and residential construction. Because we found a lot of similarities, but there are a lot of differences in each one of these industries. And uh, as you can see, the commercial construction led the way, way with uh, 30, almost 35% of the fatalities uh, based on our study. Next, next slide, please. Now, when we go to injuries, rigors pop up to the top. And you would think since they're close to the load, uh, when it first comes up, and once again, we're talking, they're close to the load, which they should not be close to the load. Uh, I know a lot of them like to put their hands on the load, things of that nature, but the best thing is to stay away, get it up, get it balanced, then uh, uh, take your tagline and continue on. Uh, number two in entrance, other field personnel again. So uh, this is a, a serious issue that we're seeing in the data that's coming out that uh, either we're not completely clearing out the area or we're not giving fair warning to people that are lifts are being conducted. And then the third is the, the iron worker receiving uh, the load, either in structural steel, receiving a load up on the roof, things of that nature. And once again, commercial construction leads the way in injuries with around 38% of, uh, uh, of all the accidents that we looked at uh, were in the commercial construction. Uh, area. Next, please. If we kind of can sum up some of these statistics, uh, we're looking at uh, 146 of the 701 crane accident 
involved one fatality. So about one in five accidents results in a fatality. And that's around 33, 34 fatalities a year. Uh, out of that 701, 408 result in injuries. So one, one out of every two accidents has some type of injury that occurs. Now, what we did, and, and this is a question that we get a lot, uh, what, is the, what are the similarities with other heavy equipment? And so we analyzed each one of these accidents. Uh, we looked at, was there even a load on the hook? And to our surprise, 30, almost 35% of the accidents that occurred did not have a load on the hook. So you're traveling, you're swinging, you're booming up and down, you're doing some type of operation with the crane, but you're not yet getting, uh, getting ready for the lift itself. Um, 167 of those uh, resulted in an injury and 83 in a fatality. So it is a serious situation even when there's not a lift going on. Um, particular attention has to be made. Make sure you have your barriers up. Make sure people are clear. Uh, not around the crane when you when you start your your operation, so there is really no difference I see uh, between a crane and other heavy piece of equipment that is physically moving on a job site. Next slide, please. Now, if if you listen to anything, listen to this one. Uh, Tom started out on the importance of a um, of a pre lift meeting. Uh, and uh, Mike is going to go into some great detail on, on how he teaches that. And I think we can all agree new employees are inherently more likely to be involved in an accident as compared to more experienced workers. That's why you see a lot of times special colored hats for those workers or they're assigned to shadow a more experienced one. We have that same thing when crew members are not familiar with each other. And I can give you a quick 35 year iron worker, been working with one crew for quite a few years, gets appointed to another crew, and he doesn't or he hasn't gone through the same process of disassembling a, a, a jib on a, a tire crane as the crew he's with. He removes a pin out of sequence. It's in his sequence, but not the others. Because of the lack of communication, he ends up falling on it. And so uh, there's constantly changes. That's why this pre-communication, pre-lift meeting, <laughs> excuse me, allows you to discuss what's going to happen, what procedures you're going to follow. And I think one of the things Mike's going to talk about is crane movements, where you physically talk about how, what steps the operator is going to take, whether it's uh, booming up, swinging right, booming down, lowering the load, the workers should always follow the load, not be in front of the load. So you know where everything is headed, make sure those areas are cleared out. So I wanted to look at the risk analysis uh, on that. And this is pretty surprising that analysis indicated that crane lifts that did not have a pre-lift meeting have a 330 times higher risk of having an accident than the one that has a meeting. So that should get your attention uh, to make absolutely certain that communications are conducted and that you have that pre-lift meeting. So understand your roles and follow the plan. And that's it. Thank you. Next slide. I think the next presenter. Mike, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, oh, it looks like your audio is not quite working now, Mike. Um, I heard something, but you you were breaking up. Um, if you want to try to call in really quick, maybe we can answer. I know there were some follow up questions um, 
about the slides, yep. the data Jim just shared. Jessica, do you want me to go through some questions and answers? Yeah, uh, well, why don't you well, Jim? go ahead and we'll see if we can get Mike um, connected uh, on audio. Mike, if you want to try calling in via phone instead. Yeah, this is this is Doug. I'll, uh, we have a number of, of, of questions uh, that I think we can go into now while while uh, Mike works on with Jessica, maybe. So um, the first one, I think uh, Tom can Tom can start on. Uh, you talk, Tom. You talk a, a lot about lift plan. And the question is uh, on the in the chat. Lift plan does not appear in 1926. Is, is that a term of art from uh, B, the B30 standard? So, any any more um, explanation about lift? Uh, how lift plan is defined or where it's defined? You can find uh, in two different places. Uh, there's an appendix in B30.5 that deals with uh, critical lifts. And there's also the P30.1 standard that is totally based on lift planning. Um, it's a, uh, that Mike Parnell, I think, was the chairman for a while. Um, I, I, I sit on it. It's, uh, it's a great tool. It's uh, ASME's uh, P30, not B, P, P30.1 for lift planning. And it's a whole standard dedicated to that. Great. And also kind of I'll probably back to you, Tom, again, um, you you did also gave us some information about critical lifts and uh, you mentioned some aspects of how they're defined, but it does appear that there's some judgment involved with what's a critical lift. So the question is, uh, is there a standard or regulation that provides guidelines that define a critical lift? And maybe I'll also add who 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 ultimately decides what is a critical lift? Well, that, that's pretty much decided by who's doing the work and the local authorities. Um, now, uh, I'm from New York, all right? Uh, there's, uh, Jim's laughing. We've had multiple conversations about this in the past. We have uh, dedicated regulations uh, that depending on what you're doing, um, the capacity of the, the lift as opposed to the capacity of the crane, um, if it's uh, anything to do with personnel, if it's a certain amount of uh, sale area, it's 500 square feet of sale area, if it's a two crane pick. Um, and those are all local regulations that you have to abide by, that it doesn't matter what the company's process is. But, you know, depending on where you are, if you're in a powerhouse or an oil refinery, um, everyone's going to have their own uh, criteria. Um, is, is that correct, Jim? Uh, Jim, you're on mute. Uh, yes, that's uh, even more prevalent down here in Houston um, in, in the refineries uh, because you can be picking up something very small, but if you're lifting it over a high uh, sulfuric acid line, you obviously don't want it's, it's pretty important that you don't drop your load. So uh, there are no real black and white rules. Uh, it is basically set up by each one of the entities uh, that they're uh, uh, what they feel is important. And you listed, Tom, you listed a lot of the characteristics, value of the load, can it be replaced, uh, uh, what kind of type confinements, there's, there's a number of them that, are, uh, that have to be considered. Great, thanks. Jim, there are a number of questions that came in about your presentation. We'll go, so we'll, we'll, the first one is, uh, is your database available to, to others? Is it, or Yeah, it, 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 it is getting ready to be. Uh, I have, uh, as I said, have an agreement with the Construction Industry Institute, and uh, basically it's being headed up by Mammoth has requested to put their data in, as well as there's about 50 other uh, U.S. companies that are going to be joining in, and we're going to form one large database, and both from analytics, uh, CII is located in Austin, the University of Texas, and so they're going to be doing paper studies and research, but it's also going to be interactive where you can get in and look at the data 
and uh, see how you compare it to the rest of the industry or just do your own uh, analysis. But it will be, it is coming. It's getting there. Great, great. Thank you. Another question back to you, Jim, I think is, what are some examples of uh, quote unquote other field personnel that are captured in the in the database uh, are these other tradespersons? Or? Yes, yes. Um, you know, as I indicated a minute ago, that uh, we I had one case in San Francisco. The plumbers put their plan stack right, right dead center of the building where they were just erecting columns, and uh, so you have a plumber column falls on the plan deck and uh, impacts two two employees. So it's anyone that's authorized to be on the site, but it's not particularly part of the lift itself. So, uh, yes, plumbers, electricians, management, uh, visitors that are authorized, uh, just anything other than those involved in the lift. Okay, great. Another question uh, on your on your data, I had a couple of questions related to the OSHA fatalities category. Uh, one was, uh, what is the difference between OSHA fatalities and the and the study fatalities? And then the second is, uh, are the OSHA are the total OSHA fatalities, uh, including the state plan numbers, or just federal federal OSHA? Uh, it, it is just federal. It's through the IMAS, the Integrated Management <coughs> Information System. Um, and uh, I dealt with the director of uh, construction, Mohammed Ayub, is the one that put it together for me. Uh, they had not physically, because if and IMAS is available for people, but the problem is it is so large, it doesn't, you can't search through it easily. Uh, each accident has over 450 potential categories you can put it into so 10 people can look at the same accident and have 10 different uh, backgrounds so what they did was go in there and physically take uh, uh, they got it back to 1992 for for cranes themselves because you can't even go on there and and search for cranes uh, it, it's very difficult to get in so they did it for me and uh, uh, gave it to me i think in 2017. And just connected this Mike Parnell. Ah. There we go. I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Thanks for covering Thank that good and great questions and answers going on there. We can finish this up pretty quick if we go ahead and roll through. So as Jim and Tom both discussed, pre-lift meetings critical to making sure where the crane's going to be, where the load's going to be, what's the flight path, and so on. But in that meeting, we talk about identifying load handling activity. What's what's the what's the objective? Who's going to do what? Roles, responsibilities, and where are they going to be? And then you talk through the lift and the move sequence. So you kind of try to uh, on mobile crane activities see if you can uh, minimize the number of moves. It lowers the risk. If we can make a move in five, that'd be great. Um, so if we if we pre-plan that, talk about it, hoist up, boom down, swing right, lower the load, land the load. And so if you can talk through that's our plan, then everybody that may be handling tag lines, push pull sticks, signal persons, and others associated will have an idea. What what are the five steps and how we're gonna get there? Go ahead. We uh, certainly want to confirm crane capacity. These are just administrative items, but quickly has to uh, be taken into account. Confirm rigging capacity based on the hitch configuration. And then, as Jim said, uh, whenever whenever we can, push pull sticks, uh, tag lines, those are, we just, uh, so many opportunities here and so many incidents where we have people getting crushed and pinched and uh, mashed into obstructions is because we're putting our hands on the load we're too complacent, we're too comfortable with the operator, he's the greatest guy in the world, or the the load, the crane won't do anything bad, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, a little wind comes up and it's pushing and the operator's just really struggling to try to pull it back and somebody gets crushed. So having that extension, you know, 15 foot tag line, push pull stick, six or eight feet, anything that puts a distance between us and the load is really advantageous. Go ahead. So 
as Tom said in his drawing, was really very good, is get, make sure the rigging is collected over the CG. So if it's not, we're going to have kick out. Something's going to move when the load takes off from the ground. And as he also noted, hoist line and boom point over the CG. Go ahead. And uh, in Jim's statistics, I think you see others are a big part of who's getting hurt. These are gawkers and non-essential personnel around loads that don't really need to be there. This is part of the pre-lift planning is we've got to clear folks out that don't have this part, direct participation and or work with the other foreman and the other trades and crafts. We're going to be moving this through this area, and we've got painters, or we've got carpenters, we've got electricians, got some, and all of a sudden, we just really need to have stand standby. Let's get this load through in 30 seconds, 60 seconds, and then everybody's, but they're non essential to the load handling activity, but we need to have them stand back or, or, re, or remove themselves to a place of safety behind other obstructions that, that will afford them a chance of not getting impacted with the load. So obviously, for uh, public folks and others, that we must have a barricading problem if we're not keeping out general public from certain areas that we ha where we have lifting activities. So that's pretty much bad on us. So we've got a barricade. We've got to set out our lifting zones and things where we're going to be handling loads taken off, flying, and landing. On the uh, on the assigned people is to avoid being between as you as we've all heard sometimes don't get between the load don't get on the hospital side of the load well it just means that we're we've got stuff that's not moving around that load and the load is moving and we don't want to be crushed between so we want to be moving uh, we want to be in a position that helps lower the risk to us let's go ahead with the next slide and we've kind of come up with uh, uh you know in this plan works and you'll see in this in this slide here the operators to the to the south you might say for the on the crane mobile crane, but you'll notice that the low risk zones are off to the northwest northeast southwest southeast quadrant, and it, that just means that if the if the if the load swings left or right to the operators left or right or it booms down or telescopes or booms up or retracts that we have four directional movements of the crane that take one lever to do that. Now, it, to get to the corner points where the signal person you see is, or rigger and or uh, tagline person, we have to almost do two two crank functions simultaneously. So we think it's much better to stand off to the corner, to to the to the uh, corner point. Let's say 45 degrees from the axis, and and that's going to be putting us in a much lower risk position. Jim noted. Don't be running in front of the load. If we're going to be swinging to the right, don't be running in the, you know, in the travel path of the load running towards it. Get outside the line of the swing and walk along. We're trying to make sure and maintain contact and view with the operator and our radio signal and making sure where the load's going and we're not running over anybody or anything. Taglines people and or push pull stick people typically trail or, or are behind the load in some part and parcel. Go ahead. So just a quick review, as Jim and Tom also uh, pre-plan, talk about it, let everybody know what's going to happen with the load, make sure we're within capacity, we're going to be over the CG, people need to be in the low risk zones, and then you execute the lift. Um, once you get done, talk about it and say, hey, what could we do better? Is there something, or is there another way we can lower the risk just a little bit more and make sure these things uh, are, you know, more protected for our folks, okay? Go ahead, and I think we're just about done. Thanks. Okay, and there's we have general open uh, question uh, times here. I did notice there was uh, uh, Jessica or Tom uh, uh, or Doug. Is somebody going to run the run any questions to us here? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Mike, and thanks uh, Tom and Jim and and Mike again uh, for your presentation. So we have some some time for some more questions. I'm going to try to be, be quick, uh, run through as many, and we have some from before uh, registration as well. But uh, I'll throw this one out to the group uh, who wants to answer. Uh, a question was posed, when are engineer pick points required on an item being hoisted? Someone take a crack at that one. Yeah, Tom, I think that was uh, noted on your presentation on engineered pick points on that uh, tower crane jibs section. Yeah, if you, um, when we were 
when that was actually um, the crane that was on our training facility. And we had uh, that, that whole pick was, was engineered by uh, Larry Shapiro. Um, and we had to use, uh, we had to make sure that we had uh, certain length slings. So in order to make up, it was, it was like 27 feet. So in order to make up that difference, we had a 20 foot sling and then we used chain falls. So that's where you're, uh, when you don't have engineered uh, pick points, that's when you end up having to go with uh, an engineered lift and have they, they gave us uh you know distances from the tip of the boom and from each section and that's where we attached it to so that that's where your engineered drawings kind of come into effect yeah i i would agree and if i could add there one of the things that we found uh once i started getting a number of uh, accidents of the same type and i got up to 10 I would start including that as, as an accident type. And one of the things we kept running into is the lack of pick points on manufactured items. Uh, your air handling units are by far your worst. They'll come out. You don't know where the compressor is. One end's real heavy, one end's real light. And invariably, they want to pick from the bottom, which can make it unstable. So one of our recommendations that we're going to be presenting to ASME is that uh, anyone that manufactures a load that has to be lifted with a crane needs to provide the lifting instructions and points of attachments. Um, and because right now I don't believe there are any. And because there are quite a number of light poles being one, there's a lot of things out there that there's no guidelines for, and uh, they need to have that. Yeah, I, I know when, uh, when, I, when I was still running cranes, I worked for a vendor at one point, and we did a lot of air conditioning work, uh, generators, things like that would be put on roofs. And like you said, you didn't have, unless for some, you know, once in a while, you see that center of gravity level on it, but that was, you know, few and far between. So they used to hang a set of chain falls on one side of whatever we were picking, and I would slowly come up with it, and they would adjust the chain falls to, to you know, take it a couple inches off the ground, adjust the chain falls. Um, so that would be great if that was, uh, if that's passed through. Well, and, and who has the superior knowledge of the of that equipment? The person that manufactured it, and so they can, because in large scale transformers, electrical uh, industry, they locate the CG, they have all specific instructions, and it doesn't take that much to do it on some of our smaller items either. Because that takes up a lot of time and you're relying on, hopefully you've got a, a good rigger out there that can figure it out. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and in New York City, if you have an asymmetrical load and it doesn't have um, picking ears attached, it's supplied mm -hmm. by whoever sent it, that automatically makes it a critical pick. Yeah. That's like I said, that's just regulation. All right, great. That's, I have a couple of more questions. Uh, one kind of general question, how many personnel do you recommend on the lifting gang for structural steel? Is there a guideline for that? How do they think about that? I'm just used to normal five, where you've got two that hook on, two that receive, and uh, then you'll have a foreman, either a working foreman or a regular foreman. And uh, that that's tends to be enough. Now, I will say this, on your lay down area, one of our big problems in structural steel is you do your layout and they stand all their steel up on edge and there's only a foot in between the beams and people are walking up and down and you'll hook on the end, one tips over and they get caught in there and their foots are crushed, legs are broken. Um, you know, we really need to, that's a very sensitive area that needs to be addressed because there's way too many accidents with that. Okay, and another question, who who decides when a novice is ready for the next step in managing a lift? Tom, I, I guess that would be uh, more uh, with CCO if they're going through uh, rigor certification. Uh, and Tom may know more about it than I do, but there's uh, rigor one, two, and three. One is the basic. Two is you're getting the more complex lifts, and and three, you know, I won't say you're a master rigor, but you're very close. But that's something that I know you were talking about, lift director before. 
he has to qualify for those as well as uh, uh, the crane him, uh, himself to be able to do it. So it's more of a, uh, I would say, a certification process. You go through and you demonstrate that you have the knowledge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Jim's right. You'll, uh, I mean, CCO has their rigor certs, uh, different stages, and then they have their lift director certification at the end, which is a, a, a pretty difficult set of tests to pass. Um, and, and then a lot of times, listen, it's uh, a lot of times it's that experience factor also that someone needs in the field. So that, you know, you, you combine a lot of that. Great. I'm going to jump to one. We have time for maybe one more question. I'm going to jump. Uh, something you all didn't talk about, but we got several questions in ahead of the time about uh, the use of sensors or alerts or horns. And so I'm going to read off a couple of questions and, and maybe you can, uh, you all can and opine on these. What types of sensors or alerts do you think can help workers avoid struck by incidents below the hook? What innovate, you know, what innovations are being developed related to sensors or alerts? And then there's also another comment, you know, where there's a multi-crane, multi-tower crane project utilizing whistles. And the kind of comment and question is, uh, the comment was there's a lot of there's developed some complacency of, of workers and basically they become oblivious to the to the whistles or to the to the to the audible uh, sensors. So any any thoughts on sensors or alerts? Tom, why don't, why don't we start with you? Do you? Any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I, I think Jim was speaking and he was muted. Oh, there he goes. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, the the first thing is uh, relative to backup alarms and uh, sounds that are on on the site. Um, OSHA ultimately issued an interpretation that makes that says that the backup alarms aren't effective anymore uh, because they're it's so common, and that's why I think even in sounds uh, uh, you get used to it and uh, they don't pay attention to it anymore. Uh, I'm not really aware other than potentially what cook cams, Tom, uh, that where you can see somebody, but sensors I'm not sure of. Spotters is about it. Uh, yeah, I think really, I mean, this, I mean, not even just speaking about cranes, like uh, rubber tire excavators, machines like that, There's they come with uh, multiple cameras on them now so that you can see you know, front, back, and side. But in the end, really having a spider, a spotter, there's, there's really nothing that works better than that. I mean, I've heard people talk about putting a sensor in a hard hat so that if a machine gets close, it beeps or something like that. But I mean, really having that having that person right there and he's guiding the, the piece of equipment is, is probably the best. And I mean, I've worked on two crane jobs, three crane jobs with tower cranes. And you had each crane had their own signal man, but when it came to coordinating the movement for the two cranes, you had one one signal man took control of the coordination between those two cranes, so that there was no mistake. I would just this Mike. I would just uh, agree that there are we have to build the plan and work the plan. And then we have to be disciplined to, to address, to attend to that plan. And the, this, this, the, uh, the alerts that we can get, electronic buzzes and all those things, we really just get numb to them very soon. So we need to actually have active plans that we're going to be have our own discipline to, to attend to and make it work and stop, stop the circus if it's not working and let's get people's heads back in the game. Great, thanks, Mike and, and Tom and Jim. And I think we're at we're we're out of time. And thank you for all the great questions. Tried to get to as many as we could. Thanks uh, to our presenters. Uh, again, we really appreciate it. And and Jess, um, thanks to you and CPR for putting this on. Yeah, and thank you, Doug, so much for stepping in and uh, filling Mike Mills' spot and keeping things running today. And I appreciate uh, the expertise and the time of all of our presenters. Um, for those on the line, I, we will see some of you back uh, in an hour for our second webinar today. Thank you. Thank you.